Friends, good morning and a very warm welcome to this actual worship here at Christchurch today, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. It's good to be with you again in this wonderful virtual space, but a very real space in which we pray God's blessing on us as the community of faith gathered together and as we invite the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts in this special time and as God equips us and strengthens us and sends us out into the world afresh. Our preacher this morning is the sub-dean of the cathedral and the archdeacon of Grahamstown, the venerable Mzizisi Janki. The Lord be with you. And, and also, also with you. you. Let us pray. We come now to a time of penitence and confession. Almighty God, to, to whom, whom all hearts are open, open all, all desires, desires known, known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthy magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. So together we pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly, Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Collect, let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and power of your church. Sow in our hearts the seeds of grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from the old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or, or be afraid. Have I not told you from of, from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Listen to the good news as it is proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 13 reading verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. Glory, Glory, Glory to, to Christ, Christ our Saviour. The parable of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? 
No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and put them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The parable of the weeds explained. Then Jesus left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. One of the great gifts of Christianity is that it is steeped in paradox or contradiction. Every aspect of the religion, from its theology to its ethics, to its holy book, to its founder's own identity, invites us to occupy wholly in between places, places of hard but life-giving ambiguity. Yes, I know paradox doesn't always feel life-giving. Most of the time, we want simple black and white clarity in our lives, but despite our preferences, God gives us with a rich and rigorous contradiction. God is one and God is three. Jesus is God and Jesus is human. The Bible is God's word and the Bible is authored by flawed humans. Creation is good and creation is broken. To give is to receive. To die is to live. To be weak is to be strong. My list is far from exhaustive, my brothers and sisters, but hopefully it demonstrates how central paradox is to Christianity. Paradox is woven right into its uh, fabric. At every point, Christianity calls us to hold together truths that seem bizarre and nonsensical. And yet these seeming contradictions are what give the religion credibility. If I live in a world that is full of contradiction, then I need a religion robust enough and complex enough to bear the weight of that messy world. But what does it mean to see by the light of paradox? I think it means training our eyes to gaze at uncertainty without flinching. I think it means teaching our souls to love the both and the in-between, the mystery. In our gospel reading uh, this Sunday, Jesus invites us to practice just the kind of just this kind of courage. A householder plants seeds in his field. Jesus tells the crowds in yet another agricultural parable. But while everyone is asleep, an enemy sneaks onto the field, sows weeds among the wheat, and goes away. When the plants come up, the householder servants are puzzled. Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? They ask him, where did these weeds come from? 
the householder does not spare them the truth. An enemy has done this. But when the servants offer to tear up the weeds, the householder stops them. No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I will instruct my reapers to collect, bungle, and burn the weeds, and then I will gather the wheat into my barn. As I sit with this parable, my brothers and sisters, I see Jesus asking his followers to hold two seemingly contradictory truths in uncomfortable tension. One, evil is real, toxic, and among us. And two, our response to evil must include both acknowledgement and restraint. Evil is real, toxic, and among us. For many progressive Christians, this is the harder of the two truths to swallow. After all, evil is such an old-fashioned, heavy-duty sort of word. It has an ugly history within the church, a history of exclusion and wounding. Is it not time we dispense such harsh language in favor of something softer, something gentle, more enlightened? Do we really need to call anyone or anything evil? For what it's worth, my brothers and sisters, Jesus does not share our sentiments. He states without flinching that evil is real, crafty, intentional, and dangerous. Evil in the parable of the wheat and the weeds is not a mistake. It's not an accident or an unfortunate act. The weeds Jesus describes are intentionally sown into the field by a real enemy whose motivations are loveless and dis disturbing. There is nothing enlightened about denying the reality of evil in our world and in our midst. We are like the field in the parable, both mixed and messy. Each of us individually, our faith communities uh, corporally, and our world in its entirety contain wheat and weed, good and evil the fruitful and the poisonous. But there is more to be picked up, my brothers and sisters, about evil from this parable than the fact that it is real and harmful. Jesus also says without apology that evil is doomed. At harvest time, I will instruct my reapers to collect, bungle, and burn the weeds. And again, at the, end, at the end of age, the Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire where they will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Again, this is not a truth that sits well with many of us in the 21st century. Perhaps we need to ask ourselves why. If this parable offers clearly good news for the world's most downtrodden, disenfranchised, tormented, wounded, and oppressed, then why are we un uncomfortable with its sweeping promise? What does our discomfort say about us? about our location vis-a-vis -vis injustice, oppression, cruelty, and suffering. What version of divine love are we preaching if it does not include a finale of justice for the world's most broken and desperate people? What is compassion in the end without justice? without an, an embodied realization of the good and the whole and the restored and the abundant. If there will never be an actual making right for the most victimized amongst us, then what is the gospel and why are we bothering with it? 
what is the good news for Christianity? In his ultimately eschatological parable, Jesus promises his listeners that justice is both necessary for an abundant harvest and certain because God wills it. Yes, the weeds may win out in this lifetime. Jesus doesn't deny the grim reality of life here and now. Evil may claim victory for many seasons, lifetimes, and generations, but the passionate, protective, and deeply righteous love of God will not suffer evil to rule the world forever. Oppression and pain and suffering will end. Injustice will die. The wheat will thrive and the weeds will not. All causes of evil and all evildoers, Jesus says, will be exposed and disempowered. All causes of evil, the causes we condemn in others, and the causes we anxiously excuse in ourselves, the causes that are personal, and the causes that are systemic, the causes we know about, the causes we do not know, all causes of evil, no exception. In short, my brothers and sisters, all that chokes, all that starves, all that breaks, distorts, poisons and harms God's beloved will burn away, not because God hates the world, but because God loves it. Our response to evil must include both acknowledgement and restraint. I have to laugh at the earnest of the householder's servants in this parable because it mirrors my own. Like the servants, I tend to get worked up about weeds, weeds in my own life, and even more so, if I'm honest, weeds in other people's lives. I tend to get eager and passionate, zealous for the purity of the field, possessive about the integrity of the householder, impatient for a quick, a clean harvest. Also, like the servants, I tend to lead with confidence rather than humility when it comes to moral gardening. Jesus, trust me, I know how to separate the weeds from the wheat. Let me do it, please, and I will have that field cleared for you in no time. Let's get the work over with now. Why wait? Let's circle the question of who is good and who is bad, who belongs and who does not. But Jesus says, see, no, no, and wait. Jesus insists on patience. He insists on humility and restraint when it comes to patrolling the borders of his precious field. He asks, he asks us, even as we acknowledge the reality of evil, to accept his timing instead of ours when it comes to destroying it. But why? There is no way we can police the wheat field without damaging the wheat. There is no way we can rid ourselves of everything bad without distorting everything good. When we rush ahead of God and start pulling weeds left and right, we do terrible harm to ourselves and to the field. Our sincerity transfers into arrogance. Our love transfers into judgment. Our holiness transfers into hypocrisy, and the field suffers. The fact is, my brothers and sisters, the seeds of God's life in us are still young and growing. Our roots are delicate and tender, and they need time. They need lifetimes. This is not to say we should ignore evil, but it is to say that we should move gently and with great care.
recognizing that our task is to grow the good, not bend the bed. Our job is to bless the field, not curse it. Remember, the field is not ours. It is the Lord's. Only God knows it intimately enough to tend it. Only God loves it enough to bring it safely to harvest. So once again, my brothers and sisters, we are called by Jesus to a complicated in-between, a paradox, a contradiction. Evil is real, evil is toxic and among us. And our response to evil must include both acknowledgement and restraint. If this ambiguity worries you, then remember that we are held by a God who is too big for thin, one-dimensional truths. And this is a good thing. It's not that we hold paradox. It's that paradox holds us. We are held in a deep place, an ample place, a generous, sufficient, and roomy place. Though we might fear paradox, though we might fear contradiction, God does not. And it is in God's soil that we are firmly planted. We are safe, my brothers and sisters, even in the contradictions. Mercy and witty for sure, but safe. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We bring to the Lord first the needs of our world, praying in particular for all leaders, all those in positions of influence, those responsible for making decisions concerning the way forward during this time of coronavirus. We pray, loving God, that you will give wisdom as people try to balance the needs of health, the economy, and our education. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We bring to the Lord all our health care workers, those who work in hospitals, in clinics, in medical practices, and the ambulance services. We give thanks for their commitment to caring for the sick and we pray for their safety and protection. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We bring to the Lord those who have died of the coronavirus in recent times, as well as those who have died due to other circumstances. We pray that all who grieve might know the comfort and loving embrace of God and God's people through this time. In a moment of silence, I invite you to call to mind loved ones or those known to you who recently have been bereaved. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for all who are sick, especially those who have been infected with the coronavirus 
and those who are in isolation or quarantine. We also pray for those who are struggling with cancer or other forms of illness. And indeed, those who during this cold weather have be, been inflicted with flu or the common cold. Again, in silence, I invite you to bring to the Lord consciously the names of those whom you know who are ill at this time. Loving God, we ask that you will touch them with your healing hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for all universities and schools, for those who teach and those who learn. Especially we pray for our lecturers and our teachers as they face many challenges to try and make up for lost time in an effort to save our academic year. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray, pray for the unemployed in our communities, those who have recently been retrenched or lost their jobs. We pray for the poor and for the hungry, especially in this bitterly cold weather. We give thanks for Mary Burt and all who are involved in Food for Futures feeding scheme. And we give thanks for those who have generously supported this ministry by giving of both their finances or their helping hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And lastly, we pray for those who are living on their own, for those who are lonely or depressed. We pray for the elderly. We pray for the residents and the staff of Brookshaw Home. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The offertory prayer as we come to the liturgy of the Eucharist. As the grain once scattered, scattered in the fields and the grapes once dispersed on the hillside are now reunited on this table in bread and wine, so, Lord, may your whole church soon be gathered together from the corners of the earth into your kingdom. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give thanks and praise. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth. For by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word, and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again, you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of the angels in heaven, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendour and light. Yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love, made perfect in our human weakness. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation, loving us to the end. 
he gave himself to death for us, dying for his own. He set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. On the night he gave himself gave up himself for us all, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection, his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high. And we look for his coming in glory. As we recall the one perfect sacrifice of our redemption, Father, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Look with favour on your people and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, let the oppressed go free and fill your church with power from on high. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with all your saints at the table of your, in your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. Lord, Lord unite, unite us in this sign. We do not presume to come, come to this your table, table merciful Lord, Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so that we eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. And the prayers for spiritual communion. Jesus said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Jesus, may all that is you flow into me. 
May your body and blood be my food and drink. May your passion and death be my strength and life. Jesus, with you by my side, enough has been given. May the shelter I seek be the shadow of your cross. Let me not run from the love which you offer, but hold me safe from the forces of evil. On each of my dyings shed your light and your love. Keep calling to me until that day comes when, with your saints, I may praise you forever. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious. His mercy endures forever. forever. And so we pray together. Father, Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as, as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. We worship as we say together the Gloria. Glory Praise to God, God in the highest, and peace, peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The God of grace, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, established strengthen and settle you in the faith and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be among you and remain with you always amen, amen. our eucharist is ended go in peace thanks, thanks, thanks be to god, god.